What's up guys, Dylan here, back with another Q&A video. So these are the videos where I answer all of your questions that you post across our social media accounts. So if you have any questions as you're watching, comment below and I'll answer you personally. So let's jump right into the first question here. What is a better way to approach clients on LinkedIn? Should I say something like, hey, it's wonderful to connect and then engage in a conversation? And if there is scope, send my offer? Or do I send the offer directly? So you don't want to go too indirect in that you're starting a conversation like, hey, how's your day going? Or hey, awesome to connect because it comes off a little disingenuous because it's quite obvious that you're connecting with them for some kind of business reason, right? You are probably wanting to get a sale or you're probably wanting to buy something from them. So they're not really going to be sure about that when you first connect with them, but you can be upfront about it. But you also don't need to make an offer right away. So you don't need to say, hey, would you like to buy a website? site we're currently selling them for one thousand dollars you don't want to ask for the close right away and you don't want to start off too indirectly because both of these things are going to turn the prospect off if you're too indirect they're going to see you as disingenuous which means they're not going to trust you if you're too direct it's just going to show a lack of relevance a lack of expertise and a lack of actually putting in the work to understand them their company and why they would even need your service and if they don't think that you know why they would need your service then they're just not going to bother talking to you anyway. So the best thing that you can possibly do when you connect with somebody on LinkedIn is actually to mention something relevant to them. So you could, for example, check out their LinkedIn profile, see if they have had anything relevant happen recently. So let's say, for example, they posted a blog post. So you could hit them up and say, hey, John, the reason I wanted to connect is I saw your blog post on the 10 best marketing strategies for 2023. And it really got me thinking. So I checked out your website and I know Notice that right now you don't have an explained video on your website. So I wanted to reach out because we help companies like yours communicate their core message online using explained videos. So do you see what I did there? I made the opener relevant to them. So they see that you actually have a reason for reaching out to them and that you're not just spamming everybody out there sending the same generic message. You've actually reached out to them specifically because you notice something relevant that might be able to help them specifically. And they're going to see you as somebody that actually puts in the work tries to understand their needs and maybe you can possibly actually help them at that point. So my recommendation when you're connecting with somebody on LinkedIn is not to just say, hey, you know, great connecting with you. You want to actually provide them with a reason that you reached out to them in the first place. And you do that by looking through not just, you know, their LinkedIn account, but you can Google their name, Google their company, see if there's anything recent that came out. Maybe they launched a new product. Well, if you're selling explainer videos, you can create an explainer video for their product. See if you can find something relevant relevant to break the ice and get the conversation going. How should I price my services? Well, what you wanna do is just look at what the pricing is out in the market. You go and look at your competitors and compare your competitors' prices versus the freelancer costs, and then you can see what your profit margin will be by getting an average of what's already going on in the market. How do I build trust without past work or a portfolio? Well, of course, there's a lot of things that go into trust. So first of all, do you seem professional? Do you seem like an expert in your field? Do you seem confident? Do you seem like you know what you're talking about in general? Do you seem like you put in the work to understand them and their company and their needs? But at the end of the day, if you don't have past work, if you don't have examples, you can go and get them by talking to freelancers and asking the freelancers if you can use any of their past examples. Will the freelancer not contact the client if they find out their name? No, they won't because the freelancer is working with you, right? They've already agreed to a price they're happy with, they're working with you. You're not doing some kind of wizardry here, they're just doing a project for you. They're not going to try and bypass you to get the client because it's unlikely to happen. What you don't realize is that business decisions are not 100% based on price. They're based on relationships, they're based on differentiation, they're based on the offer, they're based on so many factors, it's not just about the price. So think about it for a second, right? If the freelancer reaches out to the client, that's a little bit shady, isn't it? The client doesn't know the freelancer. The client is not going to trust the freelancer. It's very unlikely that it would work in the first place. So that's the first reason, you know, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, but the second reason is that the freelancer is not going to want to do that because why would the freelancer skip you to get one client when you're bringing them hundreds of clients, right, over the years, you're bringing them client after client after client, you're like the golden goose laying eggs for them. If they kill the golden goose to get one egg, 
is that worth it when they have a golden goose that's laying egg after egg, project after project for them? So the relationship with you is much stronger than the relationship with the client because you're the one bringing the projects to the freelancer. So they're probably not going to be able to steal the client first of all, but if they try to steal the client, they're definitely going to lose you as a customer, right? So why would they want to lose one customer that's bringing them multiple projects potentially to get one customer? It just doesn't make any sense logically. So I've never seen that happen before. I've never had that happen to me before and those are the two reasons why it doesn't happen. Most of the freelancers on Upwork have an hourly price. It confuses me a little bit. Can you please explain how that works? So they have an hourly rate because you have to set an hourly rate on your project in case somebody wants to hire you hourly, but you can also hire the freelancers on a per project basis, meaning that for example, you would pay them $300 for example, for a certain project with a certain set of specifications. Also, how do you get freelancers to be on board and ensure you're not scamming them? Well, it's pretty simple. I mean, all you're doing with the freelancer is creating a relationship with them, whereby they're going to be working for you as a subcontractor delivering services for you in your company. So you can't scam the freelancer here, you just need to make sure that you pay the freelancer uh, once you start a project. So usually what will happen when you're starting with a new freelancer, the client will pay you and then you'll pay the freelancer. So the client will pay you, you start the project with a freelancer, so you pay the freelancer. So it can be more complicated than this, the client might pay you 100% upfront, then you pay the freelancer 50% upfront. The most common way I do it is I pay my freelancers 50% upfront to begin the project and 50% upon delivery. So you can't scam the freelancer, they're not really worried about it because they're not going to start working for you until you pay them, but obviously you only need to pay the freelancer once you get paid from the client. How do you provide the service for the client if the freelancer and the client don't meet? because I thought the freelancers deliver the service. So the freelancer and the client don't need to meet because we're delivering services over the internet. So for example, when you begin a project, let's take animated video as an example here. When you begin a project, what you do is you send a questionnaire to the client, the client fills out that questionnaire, you then email it to the freelancer, the freelancer begins the project and, and that's how it works. You're just emailing back and forth between the, the delivery team and the client. Hey Dylan, I was wondering what app or software should I use to communicate with my clients, especially if they tried to contact me through my website. So the best app to communicate with your clients is Google Workspace, just an email account. That's gonna be the best app. Some people like to use WhatsApp, it's very popular these days. Obviously you can communicate via Zoom if you wanna get on a call with them, or Skype as well if you wanna get on a call with them. There are so many options out there these days, but those are my primary recommendations for communication with clients. What is the best way to get paid by your clients? So there's a few different options. When I first started my business back in 2015 now, um, the way that I was doing it was with bank transfer. So I was just sending a document, a Word document with my bank information, all of the details to make the payment and they would make a payment from the United States or whatever it was to my bank account in New Zealand. And this was just my personal bank account at the time. Obviously I got a little bit more sophisticated than that over time. So these days we do use PayPal for example to take payments via PayPal or via credit card. Our Stripe is a very, very popular one these days and I think probably the best one right now. And then you also have things like Wise, which is kind of like an online bank account, which I think is really great. You can make payments in, in many currencies. There's a lot less fees than using your bank. So it's a great option as well. So there's many options out there. Those are just a few of them. The next question here is, can I use a free website domain to attract professional clients? You definitely can. You don't need a website to get clients. When I first started my business, I started it without a website. I didn't even have a business email address. I was just using my personal email address at gmail.com and I was just sending emails to get my first sale. I didn't even have a portfolio on a website. I was just sending a Google Drive link showing them the examples of the videos. That was my first business animated video business. Uh, and that's how I got my first sales. But um, obviously having a professional website does help. Of course, you're going to get higher conversion rates that way, but it doesn't mean it's absolutely necessary to get your first sales. So you can use a free website like card.co to help you get your first sales because you can set up a free website there. Obviously their name will still be and the domain name. But of course, if you let the prospect know that we're a new company, we're still in the build phase for our new business and our new website, they'll understand that you're, you're building everything. And it also depends on which marketing strategy you're using. For example, let's say that you're doing LinkedIn outreach to get clients. Well, then you only need a LinkedIn profile and a LinkedIn account. You don't need a website necessarily in the beginning. Or maybe you're using Upwork 
to get projects. You just need an Upwork profile in that case because they're gonna be checking out your Upwork profile. So it does depend on the marketing channel that you're using too. Hey man, I was thinking, what are your thoughts on drop servicing YouTube thumbnails? And also, do you think we should offer free value to prospects first? It is a good way to gain the interest, but I have to pay my designer for the examples that I'll send out for free. So it's definitely a little bit risky to send out examples that you're paying for to land your first clients, but it might be a good way for you to land those first clients. I think it could be a good idea, but it is definitely risky. And I don't know that it's going to actually lead to more sales than just showing them a portfolio with all of your past work. So my recommendation would be, yeah, I mean, drop servicing YouTube thumbnails is a good idea, but I would start just by using a portfolio or like a Google Drive folder with all of your thumbnail examples and just sending those through without creating a free sample for them. And then if you're not getting any success with it, then maybe try the more risky way of doing things. But I definitely think you'll get results just with the simple way of doing things of showing them that portfolio. So in case you haven't already, don't forget to check out the two hour free training linked below this video, where I'm gonna show you how we make money online with drop servicing. If you have other questions that I didn't answer in this video or any of these answers brought up questions for you comment them below don't forget to like the video it really helps me out with the YouTube algorithm there really appreciate that thank you so much and I'll see you in the next video